Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this afternoon's ACRE at ANU student presentation session. We acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respect to the elders past and present. My name's Lucas and I'll be chairing today's session. Our first presenter for today is Coco Huang. Coco, please start when you're ready. Awesome, let me just share my screen then. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Coco and I'm a medical science student at the University of Sydney. Uh, today, I'll be presenting part of my honours project, which is where we developed a novel mouse model of wound healing in type two diabetes. So I'm sure everyone here has heard of, or maybe you even know someone with diabetes because it's a disease that affects many Australians, uh, the majority of whom have type two diabetes. And type, uh, diabetes has a significant total annual cost impact in Australia, and it's becoming increasingly prevalent, especially type two diabetes. And now here's how type two diabetes develops. So normally when you eat a donut, your digestive system breaks it down into glucose, um, which is a simple sugar that is released into your bloodstream. So your pancreas contains islets um, with specialized beta cells, and these beta cells secrete the hormone called insulin. Now how insulin works is it encourages the cells to transport glucose out of the bloodstream and into the cells for storage or use. So this decreases blood glucose back to normal. However, if you eat too many donuts and too often, and your cells are constantly exposed to this high blood glucose, the cells don't respond as effectively to insulin anymore. And this is called insulin resistance, where the cells no longer take in as much glucose from the bloodstream. And over time, we've got glucose building up in the blood and this hyperglycemia or high blood glucose level can go on to exhaust the beta cells here. So they no longer secrete as much insulin as they should. And this is called insulin deficiency. As a result, this means that less um, glucose will be taken up by the cells and it worsens the hyperglycemia and that can cause damage to many tissues. So this is how type two diabetes arises. And today I'm just going to focus on a skin complication associated with it. So namely delayed wound healing. And we think this arises due to chronic inflammation in diabetes, um, as well as vascular complication of diabetes. So an example of delayed wound healing is foot ulcers, which up to 34% of people with diabetes will experience in their lifetime. And these are open wounds in the skin that take an abnormally long time to heal. And they can cause much pain, suffering, um, poor quality of life, and lead to sepsis and even amputation. So we really want to avoid these. Now, how do these foot ulcers arise? Well, normally after a skin injury, so like if you step on something sharp, the cells form a clot at the site of injury, and this um, stops the bleeding. And then lots of pro-inflammatory chemicals are released by the cells um, to kill the bacteria and sterilize the wound. The wound then contracts and the blood vessels reform. And then this initial clot is replaced with granulation tissue. And finally, the granulation tissue uh, matures and the blood vessels regress, and then the wound closes over completely. However, in cases of chronic wounds, these two stages occur much later than normal, and the wound persists and it's stuck in this inflammation phase. So there's uncontrolled and excessive inflammation, and this will promote tissue injury and it will prevent the wound from completely healing. And this is what causes foot ulcers. Currently, there are a few um, type 2 diabetes mouse wound healing models. And although these mouse models are really important because they can let us examine wound healing through all of its stages, which we can't really do in humans, um, these models do have their limitations. So for example, several studies have found severe impaired wound healing in these DBDB mice, and they have a genetically mutated leptin receptor, so they don't feel full after eating. And although they do resemble type two diabetes as they overeat and they have obesity and hyperglycemia, um, in humans, type 2 diabetes actually develops over a longer period of time, normally after the age of 45, whereas these mice have more severe diabetes from a young age. In another model of non-genetically modified C57BL6 mice, um, type 2 diabetes is induced by a single high dose of STZ, and this is a drug that kills all these insulin-secreting beta cells, and it causes um, diabetes by insulin deficiency. But this doesn't really imitate um, type 2 diabetes in humans, because um, in this case, most of the beta cells are completely killed. So it causes insulin production to immediately stop. Whereas in humans, the beta cells gradually lose their function. And another limitation is that the current models have only studied one gender in isolation. And in humans, women have been found to have faster healing diabetic foot ulcers than men. 
but it's still unclear what role behavioural or hormonal differences may play. So there's clearly a need for a new model that can overcome all of these current models limitations. Hence, that was our aim, to develop a novel two-gender mouse model that more closely reflects um, delayed wound healing in type 2 diabetes in humans. So using our lab's uh, model of C57BL6 mice, from the age of six weeks, the mice were fed a high-fat diet for eight weeks to induce insulin resistance. Then they were injected with a low dose of STZ twice over two days. So the low dose damages, but doesn't completely destroy all of their pancreatic beta cells, and it causes insulin deficiency. And after another 10 weeks of high-fat diet feeding, um, wounding occurred. So four circular wounds, each of them four millimetres in diameter, were made on the mice's back skin using a punch biopsy. And these wounds were photographed daily over the next 10 days. Then the mice were sacrificed and four square patches of skin, so each eight by eight millimetre by eight millimetre, were collected for future study. And this wounding procedure was done concurrently on the controlled chow mice that were fed only normal chow. Body weight uh, was measured weekly around lunchtime and random blood glucose was also measured weekly um, in the morning using tail bank blood. So we then quantified wound closure by using ImageJ computer analysis of the photos we took of those wounds at zero, four, seven and 10 days post wounding. We defined wound closure by skin re-epithelialization. So that is the regrowth of this top layer of skin, the epithelium. And for each wound, the open wound area that had not yet re-epithelialized was digitally traced. And this analysis was done unblinded. Uh, you can see here that sometimes the wounds were scabbed. And when they were scabbed, we considered any darker areas within the scabs um, to have not yet re-epithelialized and treated it as open wound. Otherwise, some flat uh, scabs that were uniformly, uh, uniformly dark and flaking, we considered those as completely closed. So wound closure rate was expressed as a percentage of the initial wound area that had not yet healed um, at each time point. And these wound closure rate values were averaged by the group of interest here. So these are the groups. We had um, 16 diabetic, 12 control mice. Each group was half male, half female. And half of each of these groups were either housed singly, so one mouse by itself with no wound covering, or communally in cages of three to four mice with a plastic tegaderm bandage covering the wounds because we were interested like whether there might be a significant difference in wound closure between these conditions. So here are the results. Um, firstly, this is blood glucose, diabetic males in dark blue, control chow males in light blue, diabetic females in dark pink, control um, chow females in light pink. So overall, you can see that the diabetic males had higher blood glucose levels than the chow as expected. Um, and this, the diabetic, yeah, all the diabetic mice had higher blood glucose levels than the chow, and this was statistically significant in both the male and the female groups. Uh, furthermore, the diabetic female group, um, which is this dark pink, had lower blood glucose than the diabetic males. And there were similar trends in the body weight. So the females were not as heavy as the males, and in particular, the diabetic males were heavier than the diabetic females. So already there's evidence of a gender difference in terms of the male diabetic mice being heavier and having higher blood glucose levels than the females. So now let's have a look at the wound closure rate results. Um, so for the singly housed mice without the tegaderm bandage, so these diabetic mice in orange had uh, statistically significantly uh, lower wound closure rates compared to the controlled child mice in green. As you can see here at four days for both male and female, and also um, at seven days for the females. And this is what we were expecting and hoping to see um, in our model. So we were hoping to see this delayed wound healing in the diabetic group. However, in the communally housed mice um, with tegaderm, there wasn't a significant um, difference in wound closure between the male um, diabetic and control mice. And in the females, the diabetic group actually had a higher and better wound closure rate. So this was a bit strange because we clearly didn't see impaired wound healing in the diabetic group. And we think maybe tegaderm bandage, um, that could have been the confounder, as it was just very poorly retained by the mice. And this suggests that Single housing is the most suitable for uh, future studies, as in single housing, we saw um, delayed wound healing, both in the male and female diabetic groups, compared to the child control. So this study is significant because we've developed the first two gender mouse model of type two diabetes that more closely resembles a human condition. Um, we also found delayed wound healing in the diabetic groups of both genders um, under single housing conditions. And this can be used in the future to study the effects of wound healing drugs, interventions in mice, and how these effects might differ between the genders. There's a lot of future work that can be done. So from the tissue samples that we collected, 
we can do um, H&E staining to confirm wound closure and study how the histology or the microscopic structure of the skin differs in disease and by gender. Uh, we can also do immunophenotyping to study different immune cell types um, involved in wound healing. For example, we can have a look at the macrophage and monocyte populations, which have pro and anti-inflammatory functions in wound healing. So take home message is this new model um, we've developed will definitely be useful for future mouse studies of delayed wound healing and type 2 diabetes. Thanks to my supervisors, everyone involved. Uh, here are my references and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Coco. Uh, there are now five minutes for Q&A. Judges, do you have any questions? Just one. Um, Coco, th this is about the subject matter rather than your presentation. Does the bandage issue have any implications for treatment of people? Uh, it does, because normally um, the current standard of care for treating diabetic foot ulcers in people is that you go to the clinic, they give you some antibiotics, um, and they usually give you like a hydrogel um, or uh, some sort of bandage to um, soak up the fluid. So it actually might be useful and it actually might be good in keeping the wound moist because there's um, evidence that keeping the wound moist in the first few days of healing um, actually can improve wound healing. However, I think in this study, the tegoderm bandage was more of a confounder because we had evidence, a lot of evidence of poor tegoderm retention by the mice. Um, so for example, um, the mice, they, we think like their grooming behavior um, when they were housed together with that tegoderm bandage could have, um, potentially worsened um, the inflammation in their wound healing. Um, and also we had a mouse, unfortunately had to be euthanized early because they developed um, an infection and they were in that tegoderm group. Um, so yeah, we think um, tegoderm would best be avoided in uh, later versions of this model. Yeah, look, the reason I'm asking the question, I, I certainly understand the point you're making, but um, the, the reason I'm asking the question okay. is, uh, this is a mouse model so it's not yet, I mean, while I appreciate that you've connected this to long-term um, uh, treatment of people, but from the perspective of a, uh, a, a lay audience, uh, why is it important to have a mouse model or what does this mean for me is a point that perhaps could have been brought out a little bit more clearly rather than waiting until the, you know, the longer term. I was, I was just wondering whether there was something there that you could have hooked onto in terms of your presentation um, to make the results more immediately um, relevant, interesting, meaningful for a lay audience as opposed to your very clear statement of, I mean, scientific um, relevance you've made very clear um, it, it, that was very well done but of course when you've got audiences like us you don't necessarily um, press all the buttons with oh this is for somebody else so just just a bit of feedback there. yeah yeah thank you. thanks for that point yeah I I do think it doesn't seem to have too much relevance for the lay audience aside from maybe one day if you do develop a diabetic foot ulcer the drugs that we're using to treat you may have been developed using this model yeah, yeah. Thank you. And, yeah, I think that's exactly the point. The reason why we use mouse models is simply we can't uh, test novel drugs or novel treatments straight on humans. So you do need to go through the mouse model and, and typically other um, animals as well before you can actually um, get approval for clinical trials, phase one clinical trials. So that's a very valid point. Um, so my question was more about the actual analysis of uh, what you considered was closed versus open wound. So you said that um, the scarring you considered um, as closed and it was the darker part then that you would sketch around with image J to effectively get your value, right? Yep. So um, did you notice any differences in the mice at all? I mean, I'm thinking, if you think of uh, little children, <laughs> you sit there and whenever you get a scab, it's itchy, right? And so they do tend to like scratch it and, and it falls off, for example. Did you take that into consideration or did you notice whether a lot of the mice would do that, that they would try and scratch it off? Uh, behaviorally, yes, there was um, scratching at the wounds and that was worsened with the tegoderm condition. In terms of analysing the wounds um, digitally, yes, there was also quite a variety of scabs and 
different colors and different ways we had to measure that. But we've standardized that um, and we've got a whole procedure with images of like what counts and what doesn't depending on the different types of scabs. And we're also going to perform a blinded analysis of that. So we're going to give a person um, the pictures we have, we're going to give them our um, little assessment guide and we're going to ask them to um, try and reanalyze the wounds like that. And that would be a great idea. Yeah, so that's, uh, the, yeah, the differences that you saw, while statistically you say they're significant, you know, it's, it doesn't pass the, you know, the bleeding eye test. When you look at it, you go, oh, it's overlapping and all the rest of it. So you'd want to need, you'd need to make it a bit more robust and, you know, a bit bigger so that you could have a true appreciation and test drug treatments and stuff. But then your, your end values were only three or four, weren't they? Can you think of anything else that you might do? do Sorry, Kate. It's, that's, that's five minutes. We're going to have to end the Q&A session there. Apologies, guys. It's just Sorry. due to time limitations and the number of people in this session. We're going to have to move on to our next present presenter, which will be Lily Ketchington Evans. Lily, please begin when you're ready. Alrighty. So my name is Lily Kensington Evans, and I'm going to be telling you about my honours project, Tricking Bacteria with a Trojan Horse. So I'll cover some background on antibiotic resistance, chemical synthesis, my results and methods, and conclusion and looking ahead. So we've passed the era of antibiotics being the magic bullet for treating bacterial infections, and we have seen resistance to all antibiotics at our disposal. And this crisis is one of the biggest threats to global health, security and development today. Antibiotic resistance has arisen from our misuse and overuse of the drugs, as well as intrinsic resistant factors to bacteria namely the efflux pump and outer membrane. So the World Health Organization highlights several pathogens that pose a significant threat due to their multi-drug resistance, including five gram negative bacteria, as seen here. Gram negative bacteria possess the additional factors, the efflux pumps and the outer member bilayer, which reduces the drug uptake and efficacy of reaching the internal targets in the cytosol. So we can bypass this problem by tricking bacteria into actively taking up our drug compounds. And this is known as the Trojan horse approach. You may have heard that bacteria produce antibiotics themselves as there is a competition for existence in the environment. And a class of these antibiotics are called Sideromycins. These compounds are excreted by bacteria and they have a generic structure. And they comprise of an antibiotic and a siderophore, with the antibiotic being released once it's internalized in the bacterial cell. So a note on siderophores. A siderophore is an iron chelating compound produced during periods of iron starvation, and it's to obtain the essential element. As bacteria have tr dedicated transmembrane proteins to recognize siderophores, sideromycins and our synthetic equivalents hijack the existing machinery as they recognize this complex. So this is where my project comes in. Most Trojan horse drugs currently use conventional antibiotics with known resistance. And I'm aiming to synthesize a novel metal-based antibiotic that bacteria won't recognize and develop resistance to and attach a siderophore. So how do I go about doing this? Well, I'm a synthetic chemist and I think about how do we make a compound? What are our building blocks? And more importantly for my project, how do we design and make a Trojan horse? My building blocks are the periodic table, and that includes the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen elements of organic chemistry, and the inorganic elements of gold and silver. So I'm a bio-inorganic chemist, and I'm thinking about how to put all of these together to form something quite complex. And really, that question is, how do I go from a simple molecule like this, called phthalic anhydride, using my elements, to make something with that general sort of structure like this. So this is where my antibiotic comes in. I have a gold atom, which has bacterial properties, antibacterial properties, and I've attached it to two N-heterocyclic carbenes. So that's just the pentagon shape. I then link it to a hydroxamic acid, which is this sort of pincer with the two oxygens and the nitrogen. And I have several compounds that I'm wanting to catalog to see the difference uh, in uptake and also in solubility. So how things dissolve and how the bacteria cell responds. And the difference is this linker here. So there's three carbons on this one, and then there's just one carbon linking, but I'll be focusing on my three carbon linker. 
for my synthetic path, well, my methods and my results are one and the same. My methods is how I problem solve. So I began with this phthalic anhydride and I aimed to synthesize an amine. So that's my block one, which took several steps. I then take my amine and I synthesize two amides. And this is where I have some difference. Again, the propyl linker, so there's three carbons and just a single methyl linker, one carbon. And this is just a counter ion that will be present in subsequent syntheses. So I then take these two compounds and in separate reactions, react them with something called an imidazole. And again, this is where I have some more variation in my structures. This R group means a variable, and I can either have a one methyl or a ethyl, so two carbons, chain at the end. And this also has implications for solubility and again, how the bacteria cell will recognize and respond to these sort of drugs. I then take this sort of structure and I hydrogenate it. So I wanna remove this group called a benzyl group, which contains seven carbons. And that way I can release this oxygen and that's forming my siderophore, that sort of arm that picks up iron. I then finally take gold and two equivalencies of the appropriate sort of hydrogenated imidazolium, this structure here, and I come out with these compounds. I just want to note that these are in gray as I've yet to complete synthesis, um, that's currently underway. So I'll be talking again about this purple linker that I'm currently synthesizing. I'd like to focus on two particular blocks and the relevancy and also what makes this such an exciting project because nobody's actually made these compounds before. So I took this n benzyl hydroxy 3 bromopropanamide number eight. I react it with an imidazole, and for chemists out there, uh, this is just under pressure. And I got a pretty good yield of 85%. What's interesting is, uh, you know, this has variation already, so I have variables in my solubility, and I can sort of test the compounds in that way already. And I then hydrogenate, so I want to release this benzyl group with just a palladium on carbon catalyst in methanol at room temperature stirring overnight. And again, I get a pretty nice yield of this, uh, 76 to 80 percent. And I'd just like to point out the counter ion bromine here, because this whole molecule has a positive charge. But I'll be excluding it for the rest of the slideshow, just for clarity. And so I can confirm that I've made these specific structures because if we take the chemical formula of my predicted compounds and we add up all the masses, we get the exact mass of 274, which we see here, which is rounded to two, and 260.1, which is rounded down here. And this is called a mass spectrum. So this is one way that I've characterized and analyzed my predicted compounds. Again, I hydrogenate, so I want to remove that benzyl group and I calculate the exact mass. And once again, I see my exact masses. Um, the other spikes present are to be expected, but it's great that my, you know, the highest intensity and the peak of interest is present. And again, I can compare the two. So this is the starting material, that one with the benzyl group. And I appreciate that these lines may just look like lines for a lot of individuals. But this is important because these sort of lines here correspond to this group, which correspond to these numbers. And we see once we hydrogenate and we release this oxygen, that that group has disappeared. So we'd expect it to see it around here, but we can confirm it's gone. The next steps are to test the ion chelation. So how well can one of my siderophores actually pick up iron and will bacteria recognize it? As previous studies you know, in the field have also documented resistance, like they use antibiotics with documented resistance, the beta-lactams, I also want to test the antibiotic effect because bacteria haven't seen this type of structure before, so they shouldn't have developed resistance. And previous studies from our lab on similar compounds that look like this side have sort of documented that no resistance has been seen. This is really fascinating because the two have not been coupled and investigated previously, meaning that nobody's really taken this sort of inorganic an antibiotic and linked it to a siderophore. So onwards and upwards. My two sort of general aims for this project really were to create a su successful synthetic strategy, which I have so far, um, awaiting results on the other one with the shorter linker, 
And my aim too was to optimize bacterial selectivity because if we can trick bacteria into taking up one of our noble compounds where our Trojan horses releases metal ions instead of soldiers, we might just be able to restock our arsenal in the battle against antibiotic resistance. Thank you. Question? Thanks, Lily. There's now five minutes for Q&A. Uh, judges, have you got any questions to start us off with? Um, I'm happy to start. So I find it really interesting. Um, how did you decide on what actual compound to start with in the first place? I mean, there would have been a good <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, so incredibly fascinating. So um, that and heterocyclic carbine, which links to a gold, they are of interest because the way that they bind to the metal leads to the slow release of the metal iron. And the metal iron, like gold and silver, both have antibacterial properties. So that's well known. And our group last year published a paper, and I wasn't a part of the lab when this was published, um, showing and highlighting that these novel and heterocyclic carbines with gold did have antibiotic properties. And they had a more complex arm, so theirs was a bit longer. And the theory was, that um, something so inorganic that bacteria didn't develop any resistance to should be tried for the Trojan horse approach because the Trojan horse approach has been quite successful and they've even sort of gone to, I think two have gone to clinical trial. But the problem is they use beta-lactams, which we know the gram negative have beta-lactamases that break down those beta-lactams immediately. So that was sort of the idea behind taking that specific drug. Um, and I've got another question, but Anne, if you've got a question, I'm happy for you. I can go. So um, I'm interested in the way that you talk about bacteria resistance. Okay. Mm -hmm. So whilst you're saying that the bacteria right now don't have resistance to it, the whole idea about bacteria is that they divide, you know, very quickly and, yeah. and they'll have genetic changes during that. And so they can acquire resistance. Mm. So how would you address that then? I mean, that could still happen, right? Oh, yeah, completely. You know, E. coli divides, what, every 20 minutes or so in a lab? Um, so this is where it's really exciting, is that gold and silver nanoparticles that have formed the basis of a lot of antibiotic resistance studies for these novel sort of metal compounds have yet to have resistance. So silver oxide, namely, you know, has been used for years, um, obviously not so much anymore, but that formed the basis of silver nanoparticles and gold nanoparticles. And they've found to act on various biological targets in bacterial cells. And in like in your current literature, seeds no resistance. Um, I believe silver oxide had some resistance documented back in like the 90s, 98. Um, so that is sort of the idea that if we can still use these metal ions that haven't had resistance, like the coinage metals as well, then perhaps we'll be lucky. And um. I can't disclose all information, but I know that um, some of the previous compounds synthesized by others in the lab have had quite successful resistance studies done in that they haven't seen resistance. Yeah. Okay, and when you do test them, I've got time, what sort of bacteria are you testing them against? Are you gonna test a whole range or are you just going for gram negative? Yeah, I'm going for gram negative. So our lab has previously looked at gram positive as well, and I've know that they've um, sort of classed out, but I'm looking at gram negative because the type of siderophore that I've used is called a hydroxonic acid. And that's a really common gram negative one. And also because the World Health Organization does list the escape pathogens, five of those being um, you know, Enterococcus, Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, which is gram positive, then Klebsiella and you know, pneumonia. So I wanna look at those ones and see if I could have those five species because that'd be great. That'd be a lovely little story. <laughs> so, and um, thinking about Anne's question mm. to Coco as well, bringing that up in the front and telling mm -hmm. us how those gram negative ones, these ones are, you know, we've got issues with and what diseases they could cause would make your late audience a little bit more excited. I, I was excited, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, thank you so much for the feedback. No worries. That's good. All right. If no one has any more questions, I think we can move on to the next presenter, uh, which will be Sichi Chen. Sichi, please begin when you're ready. Yeah, sure. I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. OK. 
Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Suchi Chen from University of Sydney and today it will be a great pleasure to share my research assessing the efficacy of herbal medicines in an animal model of inflammatory bowel disease. This project is co-supervised by Professor Paul Whitting and Dr. Gufa Mahmud and collaborated with Associate Professor Ron Long Huang. Inflammatory bowel disease or IBD is a chronic disease characterized by relapsing intestinal inflammation as you can see on the diagram here. Though the cause of the disease remains largely unknown, unregulated um, production of myeloperoxidase or MPO, an antibacterial enzyme, is found to contribute to perpetuated inflammation in IBD. Acute colitis and Crohn's disease are the two main types of IBD. IBD has highest prevalence in Western countries with more than 0.3% and rising incidence in Asia. Symptoms of IBD include abdominal pain, diarrhea, rectal bleeding, and weight loss. These debilitating symptoms can often lead to depression. Besides, mortality is linked to 60% higher incidence of progression to colorectal cancer in IBD patients. Overall, IBD causes disabling health problems and heavy productivity loss on individuals, and it also imposes a huge economic burden on the society. To date, there is still no permanent cure for IBD. Current clinical therapeutics include immunosuppressants, non-steroidal drugs, dietary changes, and surgical resection. However, these therapies suffer from many disadvantages, such as severe side effects, intermittent relapse of the disease, and high out-of-pocket costs. Therefore, treatment strategies with few side effects are desperately needed. Natural products, especially medicinal herbs, may have potential to be such next-generation drugs since they have shown anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties with relative safety. Importantly, they are cheaper and more accessible in many countries. Medicinal herbs thus have been used for centuries, especially in Asian countries, and several have been developed for Western medicinal purposes in recent decades. Studies have shown that 21 to 60% of IBD patients have used alternative medicine, among which herbal therapy is the most popular. As a result, there is a significant request for scientific data to evaluate both the efficacy and safety of these remedies and to support the use of such medications in IBD. This leads to the hypothesis and the aims of my project. I hypothesized that herbal medicines have positive impacts on IBD. First aim was to assess the efficacy of orally available herbal medicines in a mouse model of acute IBD. Secondly, to compare the therapeutic effects of herbal medicines between groups relative to a synthetic drug. Lastly, to determine molecular mechanisms of herbal medicines amelioration of experimental IBD. Since our lab is actively working on IBD, recently we have shown the positive impact of a synthetic drug, SAD3241, which is a myeloperoxidase inhibitor in this um, Frontiers in Pharmacology paper. SAD3241 is developed by AstraZeneca and tested in a few clinical studies related to neuroinflammation models, but not in IBD. So how active are herbal medicines compared to this drug? Thus, in my project, I used SAD3241 with proved effect against IBD as a positive control to study the therapeutic effects of medicinal herbs. Among various natural products, we selected these three drug candidates, curcumin, amnum velocum, and Odelandia diffusa, considering their robust anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. Moreover, they are widely used as, as food additives which demonstrates their safety profiles. Let's start off with experimental design. Dextrin sodium sulfate, or DSS, is a chemical that we gave to mice to induce experimental IBD. Mice were randomly divided in, into six groups, with six animals in each group. First group is the mock control group, where mice were treated with water only for nine days. All other groups were treated with 2% DSS. Third group is our positive control group, where the mice were fed with SAD3241, apart from DSS treatment. 
The remaining groups are DSS-induced colitis model treated with aforementioned three drug candidates, respectively. All groups received drug treatment throughout the course of study. Mice were sacrificed at day nine. Disease progression and severity in the animals were monitored and recorded daily after commencement of treatment. Mice were assessed on these four pathological criteria at the same time each day. Score zero was given to normal conditions, for example, no body weight loss. Score one was given to moderate conditions, for example, one to 10% weight loss. Score two indicated severe conditions. The combined score of these criteria of each mouse in every experimental group was then averaged across the entire group to ascertain the impact of drug interventions. This diagram shows the average clinical score of each experimental group on the last day of treatment. Hash sign shows the difference to control, whereas asterisk shows the difference to DSS, the diseased group. Overall, clinical score was significantly improved in SID, Velocum, and diffuser groups when compared to the mice receiving DSS alone. Notably, there's no significance between control and Velocum, which indicates that Velocum has greatly restored the general health of mice under DSS insult. Next, we are looking at the impact of different treatments on the structure of colons of mice microscopically. We stain the colon tissue with hemotoxylin and eosin staining. Hemotoxylin is a purple dye that stains cell nuclei, where eosin is a pink dye that stains cytoplasm. This is the most commonly used stain by a pathologist in medical di diagnosis. These are the representative images of staining results. In a healthy colon, like in the control group, the outer layer is lined by crates that are shaped like test tubes. The gut lining known as epithelium is intact. In contrast, in the diseased group, we can see severe erosion of gut lining and loss of crates. Importantly, the drug treatments reduced crate loss and preserved the gut lining compared to the diseased group. Furthermore, a marker of intestinal inflammation and neutrophil activation was assessed to review intestinal inflammation. Calprotectin is often measured in stool to detect intestinal inflammation for the diagnosis of IBD. Elevated calprotectin level is associated with increased inflammation. We measured fecal calprotectin using an enzyme-linked immunosorbin assay. The commercially available assay kit came in with this plate that was coated with capture antibody. We added fecal samples onto the plate, followed by detection antibody that bound to the antigen in the fecal samples. Then we added a secondary antibody conjugated with enzyme, which reacted with substrates that gave colors. The absorbance of the colors was associated with the amount of calprotectin present in each sample. The results show substantial decreases in calprotectin levels in all drug treatments, um, groups compared to DSS group, which aligns with the clinical finding that drug interventions preserve the health of mice. In conclusion, herbal candidates ameliorated the cause and severity of experimental IBD with similar if not better potency than the synthetic drug as a D3241. Therefore, these natural alternatives possess some potential as novel therapeutic agents for IBD with reduced side effects and enhanced safety and efficacy. Thank you for listening. I'm open to any questions. Here is the acknowledgement. Thank you. Thanks, Sichi. There's now five minutes for Q&A. Judges, did you have any questions to start us off with? I think we should get Lily to ask a question. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. Um, I was quite curious, just you know, thinking about the broader picture. Are you thinking about um, you know, taking the most successful can like drug candidate and then looking at any analogs, or is that something that the lab is looking at right now? Um, that's a very good question. And um, so right now we are still in the initial step of. Um, proof of principle study. So we picked um, the 
the four, uh, the three medicinal herb drug candidates. And right now, we just want to assess if they have, if if, if they do have effect on um, the treatment against IBD or not. So, looking at analogs and potentially um, transforming into um, Western drugs will be like our end goal. Kirby, thank you. Are there any more questions from people on the panel or judges? I'm happy to ask a couple of questions. Sorry, I had to quickly go and get a power pack for my computer then died. Not as organised as I'd hoped. So um, I'm actually intrigued, and Lily's question was good, about whether you would actually have a look at these compounds and work out exactly what's in it that is being effective. Um, and I was also wondering, what do you think about the idea of what controls you didn't have in your experiments were actually your control mice with the, the um, different drugs? Did you, do you think that that's worth while having a look at? Um, at the drugs by themselves in a normal person or normal mouse? Do you mean if we control the amount of drugs that we put into, we, we give them mice? I'm wondering if you should also include um, your control mice that are not treated with, uh, what is it, DSS? Um, yeah. But treat them with your, your active drugs of interest and see if you get any other effects, side effects. Um, that's a really good question. Yeah, so in, in, my, in our project, we haven't looked at, look at the um, safety of, the, of these herbal medicines yet. Um, I think that will be next step we want to look, look into if, we, if my project proves that these herbal candidates actually working against um, IBD. Okay. Um, I was also interested why you use peanut butter. Yeah, so it was because the drug of AZD3241, the synthetic drug, and curcumin, one of the herbal candidates, were administered into mice mixed with peanut butter. Um, we picked this route of administration because we, tr we tried to um, um, align with the clinical studies of AZD3241 and also the reported um, administration of curcumin in literature. Um, and also, peanut butter is a um, you know, it's, it's cheap and it's easily accessible. Yeah, we aren't allowed to use it because we might have staff that have got peanut allergies. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Mm. So um, do I have time for one quick more? Lucas, is we going to get... Yeah, going? sure, sure. We've also got some <laughs> in the audience, but no, but, um, feel free, please. Um, I'm just wondering, um, how do you know for sure, though, the mice got the concentration of drug? in the peanut butter? How do you know that, like, were there all the mice housed by themselves and so you could watch, see it eat all the peanut butter? Or how do you know they got the same amount? Yeah, and um, so the peanut butter was given around, so the drugs were mixed in around yeah. 0 0.1 grams of peanut butter. And then it's actually fed one by one by um, our staff members. Yeah. Okay, so you do know that it's, yeah. yeah, so we we'll make sure that, yeah, sorry, we we'll make sure that each mouse um, yeah. took 0 0.1 grams of peanut butter yeah. consistently. Yeah. And that's now approaching five minutes, so we're going to have to move on to the next presentation. Apologies to members of the audience who ask questions. Thank um, you. Um, thanks, Sichi. And our next presenter for today is Layla Mehag. Layla, please begin your presentation when you're ready. Yeah. Let's get my presentation up. Um, can everyone see the presentation screen? Cool. Yep. Alrighty. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Layla Mahag, and I'm a student from the Faculty of Science at the University of Sydney. Last semester, I undertook a research project at the Centenary Institute, and today I'll be presenting the findings of this project, which investigated functional strategies to mitigate the effects of PFAS toxicity in vivo. So first I'd like to provide a bit of background into my project, namely what is PFAS and why is it a concern for the environment and human health? Perfluoroalkali and polyfluoroalkali substances, commonly referred to as PFAS, are a large family of synthetic chemicals that have been manufactured since the 1940s. PFAS are characterized by their extremely stable carbon fluorine bond, 
which provides PFAS with substantial thermal, biological and chemical stability. These chemical um, characteristics have made PFAS popular compounds um, for industrial and household use over the past century. In particular, they have been used as grease resistant coatings for cookware and food packaging and as water resistant coatings for clothing, furniture and even cosmetics. PFAS are also found in firefighting foams and are frequently used in military bases for firefighting activities. Two of the most popular forms of PFAS are PFOS and PFOA, as seen down the bottom. And as one of the most toxic, PFOS um, will be the chemical that's used in this project. So why are PFAS a concern? Well, extensive PFAS use has led to its widespread contamination in the environment, where its chemical properties typically make it resistant to biodegradation. As a result, um, PFAS tend to bioaccumulate in food chains and ultimately end up being consumed by humans. Of particular concern, PFAS have been found in substantial concentrations in drinking water in Australia, posing an urgent threat to human health. This is because PFAS are easily absorbed and distributed throughout the human body without being metabolized. PFAS have a really long half-life of up to five years in humans, and they tend to bioaccumulate in major organs. Um, and this has been associated with disruption of endocrine function, specifically thyroid dysfunction and reproductive problems. Of particular concern, epidemiological studies have indicated that PFAS exposure is associated with adverse maternal and um, infant health outcomes. So this includes low birth weight, preterm birth and pregnancy loss. While PFAS exposure is associated with negative health outcomes, there has been limited research focusing on clinical approaches to mobilize or eliminate PFAS from the human body. Therefore, developing therapeutic treatments to facilitate elimination or detoxification of PFAS remains an unmet priority. So this sets the field of investigation for my current project. So the overall objective of my project was to develop functional strategies to mitigate the effects of PFAS in vivo using a zebrafish model. So to achieve this objective, um, I established three aims. The first aim was to develop a high throughput screening system for post-exposure toxicity to PFAS. So high throughput screening um, is a drug discovery process that allows quick and efficient testing of a large amount of drug compounds. So the main focus for this aim was to determine which concentration of PFAS was ideal for the drug screen. So this means finding a concentration of PFAS which isn't too toxic nor too low, but gives us an ideal window to screen drugs and to identify potential therapeutic qualities. So following this aim, our second aim um, was to perform this um, drug screen with the PFOS concentration that we identified, testing um, a range of drugs from an FDA approved drug library. And then our final aim was to validate hits from the drug screening process and to prioritize them for future studies. So moving on to the experimental procedure, as I mentioned, for this project, we use zebrafish as our in vivo or live model. So zebrafish are actually quite popular models in medical science, as they have a similar genetic structure to humans, sharing 70% of their genes. Also in relation to PFAS, zebrafish are ideal models for toxicity testing. Um, and this is because the zebrafish, the zebrafish embryos readily absorb PFAS from their environment. So first I will go over the general zebrafish handling procedure, which forms the basis of our drug screen. So zebrafish embryos were procured by a natural spawning and these embryos were allocated into plates where they were maintained with growth media. Um, the enzyme called pronase was added to the plates um, and this removes the outer chorion from the embryo, which is like the outermost membrane and it leaves us with an embryo that looks like this in the bottom corner. Next, the embryos were transferred to a 26 glass well plate with one embryo per well. And so this embryo well plate is the basic setup from which we can now perform our investigations. Um, as I mentioned, our first aim was to establish the ideal PFOS concentration for our high throughput screen. So firstly, we tested a broad range, um, broad concentration range of PFOS solutions, and we added these to the embryo plate we prepared earlier. After exposure, the embryos were washed with uncontaminated water, and this was done to remove all the PFOS from the wells um, as to model a post-toxicity experiment. After a few days, the plate was viewed under the microscope and the survival status of each embryo was visually evaluated as either normal, which we can see here with a typical control embryo, major deformity or dead. So these display um, 
different, um, I guess, responses to the, the effects of different PFOS dosage on the embryos. So these results were then quantified for each dose in figure two, um, and the left axis measures the percentage of zebrafish um, in the condition of normal major deformity or dead um, in the concentration of PFOS, which is on the um, bottom axis. So from this, we established that at a concentration between 10 and 100 micromolar was ideal, as the toxic effects of PFOS was observed without killing all the embryos, thus providing a potential window that we could use to screen drugs for embryo treatment. To find the optimal PFOS dose, we repeated the assay as previously described, but we tested additional doses in the identified range between 10 and 100 micromolar of PFOS. So in this figure, we can see that at a PFOS concentration of 80 micromolar, there are no normal type um, embryos, and we have approximately 50% of the embryos dead and 50% displaying major deformity. So this represents a concentration that is high enough to ensure that there are no normal embryos to confound the drug screen with false positives, but low enough to not have killed all the embryos, which would prevent any therapeutic effect of the drugs being observed. So with our optimal PFOS dose, we were able to move on to our second aim, which involved treating the embryos with screening drug compounds to identify potential hits. First, we added 80 micromolar concentration of PFAS to each um, well in the embryo plate. Next, the embryos were washed before we used a multi-channel pipette to screen drug compounds of FDA approved drugs. So a few days later, the plate was viewed under the microscope. And again, the survival status of each embryo was evaluated to see if any of the drugs had potential therapeutic qualities. So table one demonstrates the results of the drug screen. So from the seven drug plates that were tested, each containing 88 unique FDA approved compounds, um, five drugs had rescuing effects. So this means that they showed potential therapeutic qualities. So in this figure, we can see the difference between a normal control embryo and its close resemblance to an embryo that has been rescued. Um, after being exposed to PFOS. Finally, aligning with AIM-3, we validated potential hits through repeating the screening protocol. So in this figure, um, we can see that from the five drugs that were retested, four showed weak effects of embryo rescue, and one showed a strong effect. So approximately 40% of the embryos treated with the drug from plate 10 were completely rescued, and 60% displayed major deformity. However, there were no dead embryos. So what this rep shows um, is that this drug compound may have potential therapeutic qualities to assist in mitigating the effects of PFAS. So where to from here? Future studies will need to be conducted to further validate the viability of this drug here that we've identified as a therapeutic treatment to mitigate the effects of PFAS. If deemed viable, further testing will be used to identify the specific biological pathways through which the compound is acting and to determine whether this compound is actively mobilizing and eliminating PFAS um, from the body or whether it rescues zebrafish via another mechanism. So in summary, the objective of my research project was to develop functional strategies to mitigate the effects of PFAS in vivo, and we did this using a zebrafish model. This objective was achieved through finding the ideal PFAS concentration for establishing a high throughput screen and we then use this screen to identify five potential drugs um, with therapeutic potential. And then these drugs were then confirmed and validated um, and we narrowed in on a single um, drug candidate. So with no treatment currently available to eliminate PFAS from human tissues, this work has the potential to be highly significant in providing the first step towards clinical therapies to treat PFAS exposure. Um, finally, I would like to thank and acknowledge all those that were involved and helped me in this project. So this includes my supervisors, Dr. Daniel Hesselson and Dr. Stefan Olas, as well as those in Dr. Olas's lab at Centenary Institute. These are my references and thank you everyone for listening to my talk. Thanks, Layla. There's now five minutes for Q&A. Uh, Lily, you just raise your hand, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. Um, I was wondering how you, if you could go back to the drug slide, like the drug candidates that didn't work um, yeah. or showed no activity and they didn't rescue the embryos. So were you talking about the, the slide of the potential drug hits uh, or the table? Yeah, the table, yeah. yeah. I was curious how you dissolved the drugs in the first place and if it was a cause for concern if you know, maybe they hadn't been taken up the ones that didn't show any rescuing yeah so with a high throughput screen we're only really testing 
like one well at a time. So there's always the potential mm. that that could happen. But we did repeat each drug well twice. Um, and so the way that the drug plates came were that they were in liquid form um, and we added them into the plate um, along with DMSO. So DMSO mm. is, you might be familiar. Yeah, with yeah. Outside, um, and it's a solvent which helps with the uptake of chemicals. Mm. So we kind of did that to try and, I guess, optimise the drugs being properly uptaken by the embryos. Um, but that is a possibility. So we tried to, we repeated each drug plate um, to try and minimise that as much as possible. So yeah. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, that does completely. I was yeah curious because I have looked at some drug uptake studies, but I haven't looked at ones like that. And I was wondering if that was a cause for concern. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I had one question. Um, yep. Firstly, uh, reiterating uh, Paul's question, uh, which just flashed up in the, in, in the chat, uh, which was the question of how you actually um, uh, distinguish between the damaged, dead, not damaged, um, just a bit more clarity there. But yep. um, also, why did you select zebrafish? Uh, I don't think, I, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that wasn't a good thing to select, but just it wasn't explained why you chose uh, a zebrafish model, for instance, as opposed to some other. Yeah, so the reason why we chose zebrafish, um, I was quite surprised when I came to this project. I thought zebrafish, that seems very random. Um, but I found out that zebrafish are used a lot in, I guess, high throughput systems because it allows us um, to kind of rapidly assess the effects of drugs. So it was six days from when I collected the embryos to when we were able to see whether the drugs were having an effect on the zebrafish. So they have kind of a very rapid development, which we can use in high throughput screening processes where we're trying to get through as many drug compounds as possible to test for a potential hit. And I guess the second reason why the zebrafish are used is because they have um, a high trend, I guess they're quite well translated to human models in the sense of their genetic structures with 70% of um, similar genes. And they also contain I think 86% um, of genes that are relevant for known human drug targets. So that's another reason why we use zebrafish. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and with, um, I'm not sure if you'd like me to answer Paul's question um, yes. regarding the morphology. So it was a little bit difficult. Um, usually you could tell pretty clearly, this is what, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor um, on the screen, but this is a normal um, control embryo. So it's very straight, it's quite streamlined. Um, there's a big difference between, this is what we call an edema in the major deformity embryo. So that is a typical, I guess, um, symptom of PFOS toxicity in the embryos, as opposed to the dead embryos as well. So when we saw these, we would classify um, them, obviously, as being major deformity or dead, and we'd know that that drug wasn't having like a strong enough effect. Um, and then it was a little bit tricky sometimes to differentiate between the major deformity and the... Um, I think, can you see my screen here, the rescued embryo? So this is what the rescued embryo would look like. So it's a bit less, I guess, um, slim in comparison to the normal embryo, but it's quite different to the edema embryo, which has this big um, deformity in its swim bladder. So, yeah. Thank you. No, I might just on. add on to that. So I'm interested too that uh, you only use one concentration of the FDA approved drugs. Sorry, yeah. um, how did you decide on that concentration? Yeah, so there had been preliminary pilot studies done with doing a similar high throughput screen um, at a different lab. Um, and so they established that screening at 10 micromolar of the drugs was ideal. Um, and so I used that for this study, but ideally once we would, um, so having identified a potential drug hit, we would then go through and test, I guess, um, different dosages of the drug and Ideally, we'd construct like the dose um, curves to see um, the different effects that the drugs have at different concentrations. All right, um, we'll have to end the session there. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for your really interesting presentations and congratulations as well. And also thank you to our judges, Anne and Kate. Um, this recording will be made available online following the conference, and we hope to see you in other conferences or other sessions later on today. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well done.